So we're delighted to have Andrew Jacobs with us in the studio this week. And Andrew and I have met at several conferences and various presentations and spoken about the reaction of the audience to various thought leaders and models and theories and applications that we have seen. Um, but quite often pick up on the fact that there is perhaps an appetite from the audience to understand why they aren't seeing the traction that other people are seeing in their learning and development departments. That maybe the grass seems a little bit greener on the other side. And I know that you've been thinking about that a lot and putting a lot of that thought into a recent blog that you wrote and developing a model to help people understand perhaps why they're not making the headway that they would like to make and how they can break through. So Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And let's get started with that. What was the inspiration really for starting that blog post and developing that model? It was exactly that. Um, I'd been at an event and somebody contacted me afterwards and said, how do I put this into practice? Um, and it just got me thinking about well, people go to events, they invest their time and energy and effort, and how can they then translate that into things in the workplace? And it was identifying that there were some factors that limit that. Um, and I've pinned it down to what I think are four areas, realistically. Uh, the first one is skill, and that's the skill and ability of the learning development team and the professional. There's will, which is the motivation of the individual to want to perform the function and the function for the organisation. There's resource, which is the tools that we use to do our job. Uh, and then there's authority, and that's split into two parts, and that's social authority and hierarchical authority. And that's the, the power to actually uh, elicit some change. And are there any of those factors that you would say are either more important than others or tend to be um, more commonly found? I think the, they're all equal in some form. Um, each of them has influence with the others. Um, but without some form of authority, that's very difficult for the L&D function to operate. Um, you need to have some power, for want of another word, uh, to be able to elicit some change within the organisation, but you also need to have that, that social uh, authority where people are willing to listen to the L&D function and you're not just the shopkeeper who provides the courses. And are there any particular insights that you can give for people that may be struggling with that? Because I think you're absolutely right, it's a very common issue that we've got the ideas, we've got the strategy, we do have the business acumen because sometimes there is a, a criticism levied that they're not close enough to the business. Now, we're doing all those things, but we still don't seem to have the authority. How can you build that? Authority comes from credibility. How credible is the L&D function? Um, and that's partly being able to report the performance change and the performance improvement that we do. It's about having assurance and being professional in what we do uh, and being professional and relevant to the organisation. Uh, it's also being able to operate at a level which the organisation needs and requires us to do. So that's about thinking strategically, but acting tactically. So it's being able to knit together many different performance activities that need to be put together and being able to support the behaviour and the skills change that were needed to, within the organisation. I really like what you're saying there about the, the tactical piece because I think it's really very important. Quite often we get drawn into, right, we must make a, a radical organisational-wide change to our learning strategy. And I'm personally quite a fan of viral adoption, of working very intensively with an area of the business that has a burning platform and able to derive the benefit out of that. Um, are there ways in which people can essentially sort of take that benefit and use that to promote and market the learning and development function? Absolutely, because it's not about a learning strategy. It's about what's the business strategy and how does the learning function support that? And that's what we should be marketing, how we support the business performance, not how we create our own learning and development strategy. Now, one real hot topic at the moment that we've seen lots on are the skills of learning and development. And um, there's a lot of conversation at the moment around whether the modern practice of learning and development is ready for the changes in the way that we learn. What's your view on that? The Learning Performance Institute capability map should be the first protocol. I think for every new learning development professional because that's more current and relevant than any other models that I see at the moment. Um, but there's lots of people who work in L&D now who don't have traditional learning and development skills um, and that's what more traditional learning development functions need to understand. It's not about standing up in front of groups of people anymore, it's about understanding the wider range of skills and that's not just digital, that's thinking about working more collaboratively and more business focused as you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. In terms of people thinking about, well, how, where can I get started with this model? If this could be a useful diagnostic for me and help me move through some of those barriers that I'm facing at the moment, what would you suggest they do? 
Uh, firstly, be honest, um, and that's the, that's the key part to it. Um, and that's honesty is important because that's partly around the credibility. So actually look at the skills that you as an individual and your team have and say, are these the skills that enable us to support what's required for the organisation? Then look at the will and the motivation. What is the driver behind the team's performance? Is it about purely providing courses and activity, or is it about fundamentally changing and supporting the benefit and, and the uh, uh, development of the business? When you're looking at the resources, do we have the right tools? In many cases, we've developed uh, large, long chains of supply of particular material, and we don't want to give some of that stuff up. So it's about understanding, do we have the right tools and the right materials to do our job? And then lastly, or perhaps firstly, look at our authority. Do we have the hierarchical authority? Do we have people in positions of power who can make decisions around how the organisation performs? But then also, do we have social authority and credibility to be able to affect some of that change? That's wonderful. Well, I'd certainly say anybody want to find anything um, further on the subject and read Andrew's posts. Andrew regularly blogs on these subjects and always provides lots of practical advice, which I think people are very appreciative of. So, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.